The final item of business today is members' business debate on motion 16105 in the name of George Adam on concern for local radio content. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons. I really must change the wording in that because I always get my t tongue tied over it. And I call on George Adam to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Mr Adam. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, this debate is about how important our local commercial radio stations are to our communities in Scotland. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to actually thank Joan McAlpine and her colleagues on the Culture Committee, who I'm not a member of the committee, but they've afforded me quite a bit of time with regards to being able to ask questions of individuals in the industry on this. But, presiding officer, it's my concern that Ofcom, the regulator for the industry, is uh, attacking Scottish commercial radio as we speak. They're sleeping in the job and forgetting that they represent the public and uh, with regards to the spectrum that they actually dish out to various uh, radio stations on our behalf. And what they have effectively done uh, uh, recently has created a duopoly between both Global and Bauer Radio, the two largest radio commercial radio operators in the UK. And they've effectively created a, almost a virtual a virtual network, national network, using local radio licences for that. And when that happens, we end up getting things squeezed, like local news gets squeezed in time. Uh, we also have a situation where local music will not be played, and local, most importantly, presenters of shows will not actually come from here as well. And it seems to be that Glo uh, uh, Ofcom are lacking ambition, because during this whole time, I've been talking to various organisations and those involved in the industry, and they've been saying things like uh, the, the government, the UK government has uh, tried to encourage DAB, digital audio broadcasting, to be the future of radio. Uh, currently, FM is still the main way that people access commercial radio. So effectively, when I spoke to the, the, the Ofcom last week, I said you're quickly backing the Betamax of radio broadcasting as technology moves forward and things uh, go on. But one of the things that's quite strange and quite concerning about the way they've actually done with the, dealt with the DAB licences is the fact that uh, these multiplexes in various cities are actually run by the operators. So in my area, uh, in the west of Scotland, it will be Bower and effectively Clyde 1 and Clyde 2 who are effectively deciding how much it costs for you as a radio operator to actually buy some space on that multiplex. Now, to me, that seems too cosy, and it seems uh, against the idea of having some form of competition and being able to move things forward for uh, the industry in itself, because I would be quite concerned if it was one of my competitors and I was trying to start a new radio firm, and they were one of the ones that were actually deciding how much uh, it was going to cost. But over the past 10 years, we have had a situation where there has been no FM licences, uh, apart from one, been actually uh, uh, kind of submitted and uh, given out by Ofcom in the past 10 years. Now, that was 96.3 FM, which initially was, ironically, and I'm not, I'm not segueing this into the debate, Q96 was from Paisley uh, initially, and uh, eventually it went to various other companies and it uh, was always a problem. And it was given back by the previous uh, organisation, one of Global's uh, companies, and it was put out for auction again. Now, what happened was Nation Radio Scotland took that up, and they've proven that recently with the new figures, they've got 50,000 listeners. Now, that was their first target to show that they would, could move forward and they could compete with the market leaders that are already there, like the, in our area, it's Bower and it's Clyde 1 and Clyde 2. Now, that shows you there is a market and there is a need for listeners who want to actually listen to something new. Now, we have also Adam Finlay, who comes from a famous uh, radio, commercial radio family. His father set up Fourth Radio way back in the 70s, and he had his own company, New <coughs> Wave Media Group. But his problem was that uh, he couldn't expand. He had basically had Wave 102 in Dundee, Central FM in Central Scotland and Original in Aberdeen. And his problem was he couldn't expand his uh, to other cities and other areas to try and get some more uh, kind of radio stations set up. So he eventually had to uh, 
sell his business to DC Thompson, who are now working it, and they're keeping it very local. His very model is the polar opposite of the Bauer Global model, where effectively we have a situation where Global announced a couple of months ago that their breakfast show would now in Capital Radio would actually be broadcast from London. Now, that doesn't help us, presiding officer, in any shape or form. That just takes away from a Scottish voice being on the radio, a Scottish person or someone locally being able to do the production values and be able to be part of the backroom, uh, backroom team. And when you go, it goes against the very idea of what commercial radio was originally all about. Because commercial radio was initially the very first one that was set up was Radio Clyde on 10.30pm on Monday the 31st of December 1973. Couple of years old, a couple of years younger than me, as uh, Clyde uh, Radio, what was then Radio Clyde, started broadcasting. And that made a big difference in Scotland at that time, because that was the first time we had ever heard our accents, our voice being mentioned and uh, talked about in commercial radio. And it has another effect when we start centralising all of this uh, broadcasting, it has another effect on another industry that we are very uh, uh, important players in as well, the music industry itself. If you, in the old days in Clyde One, or Radio Clyde as it was, Billy Sloan would be a DJ who literally went to all the gigs and he knew a band. He would see a band and he would try and promote a new band. Uh, the likes of Wet 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 were massive in Glasgow before they went anywhere else uh, in the world. And it was because of playing, being played on Radio Clyde, as was then. Now, the problem for any young band now would be a situation, these playlists are actually centralised. Bauer, who own Clyde One, Fourth One as well, they effectively centralise their playlist in Manchester. So someone in Manchester decides what the list is, what the music's going to be. And since I've found out how this works, uh, my respect for presenters has gone through the roof because they basically have about two or three minute windows in between these playlists that are just automated to try and actually make the listener feel entertained and give them uh, a bit of uh, kind of local content. But then when you look at it as well, what, how it will affect news. Now, Heart uh, Radio was previously real radio. About 10, 15 years ago, they had 30% more news on real radio than they have now. Local news and uh, th uh, to deal with uh, local issues as well. Now, that's not happening anymore. We don't have that anymore. It's 30% less on Heart Radio. And it's going to get worse. If we don't actually draw a line under this at this stage, it's going to get worse. Now, I am not saying, I, I'm not a romantic that wants to hark back to the uh, old days and say that it was so much better then. Radio, people have been saying radio is going to die for uh, decades now, but it just changes, it evolves. The technology changes and people listen to it differently. But for us, the most important thing is we must still have our voice coming through whatever uh, bit of technology we use to listen to it. We need to make sure that Ofcom is doing its job and making sure that we are still getting these local messages. Because if a major incident happened in Glasgow, uh, like if you talk about the Glasgow airport uh, terrorist attack, Clyde used to have a 24-7 newsroom. They no longer have that. They have their own news up until 9.30, and then they buy it in from Sky, and there's no local news at the weekend. So if a major disaster happens at the weekend, there'll be nothing on our airwaves. That's wrong. We have to make sure that as we move forward, in, ironically, the, a world where we have our own BBC TV channel, we, uh, we need to make sure that we have that ability to still have our voice in radio. You'll hear from my colleagues and the various commercial radios throughout the stations throughout Scotland, but the important thing for me is we must ensure that we do not lose this very important part of Scotland's broadcasting history, and we need to make sure that we continue to have commercial radio. We'll move now to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Jamie Green, followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank George Adam for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber. He managed to get Paisley in a couple of times there, so uh, that's one of his records. Um, but I know he's also played a very active part in the committee's deliberations on this issue, and I also know that he's probably George Bowie's greatest fan. I hope he's got a signed photograph on his office wall. Um, there's a lot to be said about local and community radio. It's played a huge part in my life. Um, as members probably know, I spent many years in the media industry, started off my career in radio indeed started off in hospital radio, community radio and local radio, including short-term radio events as well. And I really uh, get it uh, in that respect, but also I get the fact that the world and the media landscape has changed so much over the last decade. 
Uh, like many, I worked uh, and progressed from radio into television, uh, worked on the technical side, but also the commercial side of the business as well, and understood the real commercial models and the difficulties facing media companies, small, medium, and large, including those who operate uh, many services. Uh, it is really sad what is happening to local radio, um, but I think perhaps where I disagree with Mr. Adam is that I don't point the finger squarely on Ofcom for this. I think, unfortunately, the reality is that this is the direction of travel that the radio industry has been facing for a number of years, if not decades. I go back to the days of UKRD, the consolidation of the companies uh, that owned and operated radio stations, and that is a trend that's been continuing for a number of years. Alongside that, we have the additional problem of the fact that tech has been changing. I have to say problem, it's not a problem, it's brought innovation and it's brought access to a plethora of new services to consumers, but also it's brought challenges to the traditional model. And by the traditional model, I mean the traditional linear broadcast model. And that's the case for both uh, free-to-air television and free-to-listen-to radio. Live streaming and IP-delivered services uh, are competing uh, on uh, this market and appealing to new and younger audiences. So commercial radio it has been facing a tough time for a long time. Indeed, the financial models that support commercial radio has been changing for many years. The consolidation of the ad sales market, uh, the way in which uh, companies uh, sell advertising and to whom they sell it to and how much they can charge for it uh, has been getting tougher as the market fragments and advertising revenues go online. So all of these factors, I think, uh, have come together to this perfect storm of where we're at at the moment with local radio. And that's not to say Ofcom uh, does not have a, a role to play in this and could have uh, addressed this uh, very differently, but I don't uh, buy the uh, argument that this consolidation uh, has been constructed or construed uh, through any um, regulatory environment. I think it is, a, a, in fact, a natural, a, a, a natural uh, organic uh, direction of travel for the industry to go in. So the, the role here is now what Calfcom can do uh, to make life easier and better for small operators. Some of the great work that DC Thompson are doing in trying to really localise radio again it should be uh, noted they uh, had some concerns around the allocation of new FM licenses. It's fair to say there's still spectrum and bandwidth available. They need to release that. We need to, those licenses to be released. FM is affordable. It's technically much more simple than, than DAB, as we heard. Uh, DAB is an extremely expensive game to play in. But I am uh, buoyant and, uh, and positive because when uh, Ofcom did uh, uh, try to get uh, expressions of interest for small-scale DAB, they had over 700 expressions of interest. That's a sign to me there's still an appetite out there for people to, to set up and operate radio stations. But regulation needs to keep up. Uh, you know, the regulatory environment that operates the traditional old world of broadcast media has not kept up with how people consume content, I'm afraid to say. Uh, the fact that I can set up a radio station right now and broadcast in a matter of minutes in an entirely unregulated market whilst competing against, uh, uh, you know, high budget and high end uh, radio stations that are extremely highly regulated seems to me doesn't seem like a fair playing field. So all I would say is that yes, we do need to support local radio, but we need to help local radio evolve. We need to help it change its financial models and we need to help it take advantage of technical changes that make it easier to reach new and younger and different audiences. And of course, we need to help uh, all those poor radio presenters who have uh, just lost their jobs as a result of these changes. Where are they going to go? I do not know. So thanks to George Asam for bringing this important uh, but brief debate to the chamber. I hope the committee that I sit on will continue uh, this discussion and I look forward to hearing what the Cabinet Secretary has to say in response. Thank you. Gillian Martin, followed by Kezia Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. I want to thank George Adam for securing this debate on an issue which I think impacts on the development of Scotland's broadcasting talent. For many young aspiring broadcasters and technicians, uh, local radio is a way into a career that's already a challenge to enter in Scotland with so many media jobs disproportionately being in London and Manchester. And I see the further erosion of locally produced content proposed in the Ofcom deregulation of radio proposals that, that George Adam highlighted in his motion has been a further barrier put in the way of young people who want to enter the broadcasting sector. 
Um, the moves will allow for more centrally produced syndicated content and a reduction in locally produced programmes. And I must declare a historical interest in local radio. I was a film reviewer for Original 106 when it launched in 2007, but I did it for fun rather than any career move. Um, many of the graduates of the HNC radio um, course at North East Scotland College found their first paid work on the station, which had 100% local content uh, initially, and um, was a hot bed of nurturing local talent. With the original being bought over by DC Thompson and moving into the centre of Aberdeen City, right across from the Aberdeen journals, I, I hope that will, that will continue. The station also provided a great deal of work experience for students over the years, crucial for your CV if you ever want to get a foot in the door of this com very competitive sector. And uh, just along the road, or before original was moving, uh, is North Sound Radio, which has given many Aberdonians their springboard to a successful broadcasting career since it first broadcast, started broadcasting in the early 1980s. Um, just to name check a few, North Sound gave the now household name Nikki Campbell his first radio gig. The new BBC Scotland channel's Fiona Stalker, she was head of news at North Sound in the 1990s when I first met her. Um, and the new channel's flagship uh, new programme, The Nine, presenter Re Rebecca Curran, also started a career at North Sound. There's Brian Burnett, who broadcasts to the whole of Scotland every weeknight on BBC Radio Scotland, and has had a decades-long TV and radio career. He, too, is a North Sound alumnus. My old school friend, Gary Steen, started at North Sound as a 17-year-old, instead of going to university. Um, which upset his parents at the time, but I'm sure they're now very proud of him because he's now the group programme director at Barrier Radio. And parliamentarians will be familiar with BBC's parliamentary and corporate affairs manager, Luke McCulloch. When I first met Luke, he was presenting one of the best local current affairs and music shows on North Sound in the early years of the millennium. Unfortunately, that kind of format seems to have uh, dropped out of the kind of programming of, of, of North Sound. But you get my point. Local radio is a nursery for talent and a springboard to lifelong careers in broadcasting. And it should be mentioned that Ofcom's proposed changes will keep the north of Scotland boundaries as they are, but the general trend of a reduction in the requirement for local produced, locally produced content is hugely damaging for the talent base in Scotland as a whole. Today, the approved areas in Scotland go from three to two, but how long before Scotland only has one? And with fewer opportunities to get that first entry experience into local radio, we will continue to see young talent having to move elsewhere for those opportunities, even if they, 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 even if they do exist elsewhere, because let's not forget the proposals uh, will, may pre precipitate a reduction in locally produced content across the whole of the UK. But worse than that, talented young broadcasters may not be able to enter the industry at all. And as someone who trained broadcasting students in that, uh, North East Scotland College, this is bad news for the college sector too. If there aren't any jobs locally in the creative industries, then these colleges may have to lose those specialisms. George Adam has talked about the effect of this in the listener uh, in, uh, in depth, and I agree with it, many reasons why local content is important for listeners too. But Scotland needs to nurture and keep its broadcasting talent. We need broadcasters to understand Scotland, uh, and we need them to stay in Scotland, keeping our creative industries alive and providing quality content that speaks to local people. And these proposals, I think, put that in further jeopardy. Kezia Dugdale, followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, President Officer, and can I start by congratulating George Adam on securing uh, uh, his uh, slot this afternoon. I wasn't intending on speaking. I'm speaking on behalf of Claire Baker, who, like a number of MSP colleagues, um, failed to make a flight this morning on return from a parliamentary delegation. I know she was very much looking forward to contributing to the debate and talking specifically about uh, Kingdom FM in her own region. So everything I've learned about this debate, I'm afraid, uh, Mr Adam, I've learned this afternoon, so I can't speak with the same uh, authority that, that you do on these issues. However, I have learned this afternoon afternoon that you are indeed a radio enthusiast and there's very little about Clyde in particular FM that you don't know and I wondered whether in a life post being an MSP we might see you featuring leading up Radio Paisley or Buddy FM as you might find it so uh, I'm very grateful to you for your expertise um, in this area. I wanted to make three quick points one about deregulation one about um, the charitable impact of, of radio and one about community impact 
I think the motion that Mr Adam puts forward this afternoon is quite negative and I understand the concerns that he's outlaid and they're very legitimate concerns but I guess I'm not quite as pessimistic as he is because I think um, they're not going to work. So if you look at the changes to Heart FM for example where you see somebody like Robin Galloway who presented the breakfast show being replaced by a network show in the form of Amanda Holden and Jamie Thixton. I mean Robin Galloway has been a part of my life since he presented the birthday spot in Grampian TV in the 80s. The idea that people want to tune in uh, to Jamie Thixton instead uh, I find baffling and the idea of local content isn't just about the news that's presented on the hour it's that news which is woven into everything that you hear throughout the radio day if you listen to uh, Boogie in the Morning on Radio 4 the news is part of everything that he talks about and that's what makes it uh, so popular and why uh, not only is it uh, its readership or its listenership steady it's in fact growing and it's only when listeners are growing is the radio station making the money that it needs to I think he also also makes legitimate points uh, about how new music and new bands break through. I think back to the 90s, the band The Hazy Janes um, were formed in my school. They were the school band and went on to huge success. And I remember that sense of excitement when they got their first tune playing to, on TFM and then Wave 106, as it was later uh, termed. Now, um, bands have new opportunities to break online, whether that's producing their own videos or featuring on internet radio stations, which is, uh, George Adam has pointed out, remain uh, unregulated. There are other options for people to, to break through. On the positive side, I look at the work that journalists do in Radio 4 in particular, which is the one I'm most familiar with. And regularly, they uh, champion charitable causes. Uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary might be aware that Radio 4 hosted a superhero day uh, on the 10th of May and raised just on the Radio 4 listenership area £202,000 in one day just by encouraging people to go to their place of work dressed as superheroes. And all of that money is spent within the Lothian region uh, trying to uh, advance uh, initiatives which tackle poverty and inequality. I think we need to recognise the huge role that local radio stations play in that community impact and charitable impact. Another thing I'd like to mention is that Radio 4 require all of their journalists to have a campaigning aspect of their work. And I noticed that uh, most significantly in the work that Alan Smith does in this building. I've done a lot of work with the Woodburn family when they lost their son Sean on the 1st of January at 2017. That was a national story for a day but it was a daily story for weeks and months on Radio 4 because it happened on the streets that listeners walked on, because it happened outside a pub that listeners drank in. It's part of the fabric of, of Edinburgh life. It has had such a strong connection to the local football club that it went on and on. And Alan Smith has championed the rights of victims as a consequence of that and is a leading light in the campaign for a victims commissioner, as is the station at large. I know from speaking to colleagues that other Bower journalists across the country have done similar campaigning work, not least in Clyde, where local journalists are championing uh, reforms of dog warden uh, and dog welfare legislation which is so so important so I just want to um, congratulate George Adam on securing this debate I recognize and share some of his concerns but I think it's also important to recognize some of the wonderful um, radio production values that we already have and some of the great local stations that we can all uh, continue to appreciate thank you Rona Mackay followed by Ruth Maguire Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, firstly, can I thank my colleague George Adam for bringing this important debate to the Chamber and I'm pleased to have the chance to speak in it. Presiding Officer, my second job when I left school many moons ago was working for Radio Clyde. It was an exciting new broadcaster new to the airwaves. I think I might have just given my age away, but uh, never mind. At last, the West of Scotland had a voice, as George Adam said, where we could listen to presenters talk about entertainment venues we knew, new local bands and experiences we'd all had in and around Glasgow. Having grown up listening to London-centric Radio 1, this was a breakthrough, and we didn't even mind the adverts. I have fond memories of my time as an office junior in Radio Clyde, and as a teenager, I guess I was a bit overawed by the DJs, as they were called then, who became my colleagues. While I was putting this speech together, I realised I have the same affinity for local radio as I do local newspapers, for whom I also worked in the early days of my journalistic career. They too are on their knees thanks to centralisation. Presiding officer, the key word here is local. It's so important, whether it be for local news, traffic or just general chat and knowledge about the area. People feel part of listening to a local radio station or reading a local newspaper. It's a connection that they can never feel for a remote media that's not based close to home. That's why the recent decision by Ofcom to deregulate conditions for local FM licences is baffling and frankly seems wrong. 
Of course, commercial radio stations are businesses, but that's what makes it all the more baffling because local radio is thriving and doing wonderful campaigns, as, as Kezia outlined, and it has growing audience, audience figures and a healthy advertising uh, revenues. As I understand it, the deregulation will mean a planned reduction in the number of local programming from seven hours a day to just three, with a move to produce content centrally from London. Presiding officer, this will take the broadcasting industry back by decades and will have a hugely detrimental effect on media industries across the UK. And as Gillian Martin said, it could reduce the number of opportunities for media students in an age when communication is key and evolving at mind-blowing speed. The Federation of Entertainment Unions said that the decision to reduce the number of locally produced programmes will result in the loss of hundreds of jobs and the closure of 11 local studios. They say, in the context of cuts to journalists' jobs and cl closures of local newspapers, this will add to the serious decline in local news for UK citizens. These ill-considered changes have, have taken place without adequate parliamentary scrutiny of their potential effect on local jobs, and they're calling for an urgent review of the decision by Ofcom. So I'm pleased that George Adams' motion received cross-party support, and I'm grateful to him for articulating uh, the business models involved. Uh, Labour's Culture Secretary Tom Watson MP has called the move a travesty and his, colleagues have called for a, uh, his colleague has called for a Commons debate. Presiding officer, I believe this ill-thought-out and reckless decision by Ofcom should be reversed immediately. Let's keep our radio local, give listeners what they want and give security to the many people employed in this important industry. Let's give no ear time to faceless bureaucrats with a centralising agenda intent on running down our broadcasting media. If we all make enough noise, they just might listen. Thank you. Ruth Maguire, followed by Alexander Stewart. Presiding officer, I thank George Adam for securing um, the members' debate and bringing this important topic of concerns for local radio content to the chamber. I'm happy to make a, a short contribution this afternoon. Centralised playlists of banging tunes are not enough. Local content and news are really important. As George Adam said in opening, we have to hear our own voices on the radio. So it's right we're getting the opportunity to discuss those concerns here in our Scottish Parliament. Due to new licensing regulations approved by Ofcom, it's now acceptable to broadcast just three hours of content per day from within the new areas, rather than the former local radio that we know. This means that 21 hours a day, Monday to Friday, will be broadcast from a hub. And at the weekend, there is no longer any requirement to broadcast within an approved area. Essentially, all 48 hours of programming the entire weekend will now come from said hub. The first to launch was the new Capital Breakfast Show. Airing from London, it replaced 14 breakfast programmes on the Capital Network in England, Scotland and Wales. Capital are also planning to cut the number of drive time shows from 14 to 9. I strongly believe that these cuts will have a damaging effect on local radio news and content. Radio newsrooms are a thing of the past with only worldwide news that has been bought in from Sky being broadcast after a certain time, leaving no way of reporting local news, as George said. These cuts have also meant over 100 radio job losses, local producers and presenters being replaced from big, by big names from, from, from elsewhere. There's also a risk that small businesses who once relied on radio advertising to bring in business can no longer do so. Um, Scottish communities who use radio advertising to let locals know about events and, char and charity of things that were going on, again, may have to find new ways to, to communicate those. In every corner of the UK, there are communities being left with no local radio station and no local voice. At this point, however, I should give a mention to uh, the wonderful community radio stations who are still providing a great service to uh, my community on FM, Irvin Beat FM and Three Towns FM do a really good job for folk in our area. Another um, potential loss of opportunity has already been mentioned, but it bears repeating, and it's about some of our talented local musicians. It's really difficult for up-and-coming talent who are hoping to make it in the music industry to get discovered. Now, I would acknowledge that many of the other platforms are used uh, these days, YouTube and, and Instagram, but they are pretty um, saturated. And radio is still a really important way for, for hopeful stars to promote themselves. Furthermore, for um, people that do succeed, they have little chance of making it onto the local radio station. As, as has been mentioned before, generic centralised playlists are now being used. 
and blasted out on all radio stations, meaning that it's the same music that's, that's broadcast all over the UK. We're losing a bit of um, diversity. Presiding officer, I would acknowledge that the way we consume entertainment is changing, but we still need local content and news on FM, and that content needs to reflect the diversity of all of the island here. Thank you. Can I remind members always to use the full names of colleagues, please, for the official report and anyone listening in. Thank you. Move to the last contribution in the open debate, and that's from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to take part in this member's debate this evening and congratulate George Adamant on bringing it to the Chamber. I, too, am highly concerned at the changes which are currently being made within the commercial radio sector and the industry. These changes which are being waved through by Ofcom have indeed put further pressure on local radio stations, content and news bulletins. At our recent Culture, Tourism and External Affairs Committee, I had the opportunity uh, to question uh, the reasons and the remit as to why Ofcom were making some of these changes. Ofcom say that these changes are due to increased competition and listening habits across the radio sector. However, I questioned them whether the, they were being proportionate uh, in putting forward some of these changes because most of the industry believe that they are ripping the heart out of local radio. Ofcom still believe uh, that these alterations are proportionate. Uh, it says that it is doing a huge amount of work to ensure radio workforces are diverse and better reflects the makeup of the UK. Uh, if that is the case, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, and Ofcom believe in its own lines that these changes will enhance diversity and will reflect the makeup of the United Kingdom, I would suggest that the actions uh, will do exactly the opposite uh, in doing that. Local radio does a fantastic job. We've already heard uh, in the chamber this afternoon uh, from individuals who know uh, and understand their local part and what is taking place. Uh, and it highlights and it gives the opportunity for local talents to have that platform to get that exposure. Uh, uh, and by removing some of that, uh, then that does uh, constrain their opportunities uh, and not give them the same uh, the chances that others have had. Uh, uh, and as hours are squeezed and the opportunities are squeezed, then so will the content. Uh, you know, we can look back to uh, the time of Radio Caroline back in 1964 when that uh, initially uh, came out because that was looked upon as trying to, to manage popular music and broadcasting throughout the United Kingdom as well as the, uh, the monopoly of the BBC. Uh, and it'd be difficult to imagine where many of the Caroline's broadcasters, DJs and artists uh, would be without that local opportunity of having that exposure. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, we need to think long and hard about what we are achieving here, what we're trying to achieve. And we've heard today about the, the Scottish playlist that, that's being removed and eroded. We've heard about the news content that's no longer going to take place. Uh, uh, and we, we, we all know uh, within our local context, within our local regions, our constituencies, what that local content can mean to individuals uh, 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 that give them that reassurance of what's taking place in and around about their local area. We also know that, uh, that we have seen changes and, and, and uh, many have mentioned that Jamie Green talked about uh, the way things have evolved within the industry uh, and we know that, uh, that six million people listen to, to podcasts each week in the UK and, and there's simply uh, the, uh, the argument about whether things would be shrunk uh, or move forward may well mean that people will change their mind and do different things. Localism works at every level, whether it's local knowledge or it's local artists or it's local entrepreneurs. Uh, we, we have to think about how that is managed. We, we took evidence uh, at the committee from DC Thompson, who gave us a huge insight into what they're trying to do within the industry. Uh, uh, and we've heard today about the commercial side of things, advertisers uh, and the community events that, that won't now be given the opportunity to broadcast. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I firmly believe that the further stifling of local radio content will erode uh, many of our opportunities for an individual and the shrinking of that market may well see uh, that there'll be an acceleration of precisely what the trends that Ofcom and others are trying their best to avoid. We must protect local radio stations. It is a lifeline uh, for, all, for individuals and our communities and it deserves our respect and our support. Thank you. I now ask Fiona Hislop to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And I also want to thank George Adam for securing this very important debate. Um, as we've heard from speakers today, local commercial radio makes a valuable contribution to Scotland and it remains an important part of our lives. And that's clear since Ofcom's figures show that in early 2018, 
more Scots listen to local commercial radio than to BBC stations. So it's surprising to find the very ca characteristics of local commercial radio, which people value, its local voice, the way it connects uh, communities, are now at risk from recent decisions by Ofcom. The Scottish Government is disappointed with Ofcom's decisions to permit a reduction in the amount of locally made radio programming in Scotland and to fail to protect the distinct character of Scotland's east and west by creating a single area for production across our central belt. Content on our local radio stations should, as the Ofcom localness guidelines define, give listeners a, a feel for an area and give listeners confidence that matters of local importance, relevance or interest will be broadcast. The Scottish Government does not believe that one area for the central belt delivers this to the listeners. The reasoning provided by Ofcom that decisions made on localness will strengthen the ability of local commercial radio stations to deliver locally relevant services that listeners expect does not fit with uh, the expectations of listeners to hear local voices and local issues, or as Kezia Dugdale pointed out, local charity and local campaigning initiatives. Through these decisions, Ofcom is opening the door to change, but not one we welcome. The likely result will be our commercial radio stations will gradually lose their distinctive identities, the familiar sounds of Glasgow patter or Edinburgh chatter about the things happening around us, things that really matter to communities in their daily lives will be lost. And George Adam quite rightly identifies the effect of local music talents access or rather lack of it uh, on the airwaves. And it seems we risk losing that local identity because Ofcom is not putting the interests of audiences at the centre of its decisions. The Scottish Government is concerned, as it seems Ofcom did not fully take into account the interests of Scottish listeners who responded to their consultation. Most responses from audiences wanted to protect distinctiveness, and we simply don't think the audience research in Scotland was as complete as it should be to reflect our nation's unique characteristics, as Ofcom's own advisory committee in Scotland pointed out. And indeed, Alexander Stewart questioned whether Ofcom's decisions are proportionate. Worryingly, it seems Ofcom's decisions are already having a detrimental effect for Scottish listeners. Global Radio has announced it will launch UK-wide breakfast shows and lose a distinct local breakfast programme across uh, Scotland, taking some Scottish-based presenters off air. And I'm concerned other operators may follow suit and reduce locally made programming from Scotland, meaning we may uh, lose more local voices and jobs, as Rona Mackay pointed out. And of course, Ruth McGuire has referred to the cuts at Capital Radio. The concern is that the reduction of localness requirements may lead to a greater concentration of production activity in major centres and that this may diminish career opportunities in the regions. And Gillian Martin talked about the talent pipeline uh, for broadcasting being lost. We believe that Ofcom should be seeking a sustainable system that provides greater opportunities for people across Scotland. And while the Scottish Government recognises listeners have more choice than ever, for example, from community radio or digital streaming services, this is uh, not by any means a substitute for local commercial radio. And there are a number of opportunities for the radio sector, and we do not want to see the interests of Scotland and our distinct local communities not fully taken into account. And while we understand there are challenges in the local commercial radio sector as set out by Jamie Green, and these are genuine, uh, particularly in an increasingly competitive market, it is clear that many people in Scotland consider the loss of localness to be a, a, a key concern. Within public service broadcasting, it's difficult to correlate the regulator's position on local commercial radio with a very different direction in television. In broadcasting, it seems a much greater value is being placed on encouraging distinct local creative identities and industries and the representation and portrayal of communities across the nations. Ofcom itself is reconsidering its out of London guidance. Uh, and we have seen the launch of the new BBC Scotland channel and Channel 4's move to establish a creative hub in Glasgow and commit to moving a far greater share of production to the nations and regions. We have, made, we have made our views known to Ofcom throughout their consultations and will continue to press the case and take every opportunity to work with broadcasters and with the regulator Ofcom to ensure that they recognise Scotland's national needs. When I met with Bob Downs, Ofcom board member for Scotland earlier this month, 
I expressed my disappointment with these decisions, and I have also written to Ofcom's Chief Executive, Sharon White, outlining our concerns about the decisions and the potential impact on Scotland. At the very least, Ofcom should monitor performance very closely to ensure that the public value offered by localness is not reduced in Scotland. Indeed. Jamie Green. I, I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking my intervention. Isn't it the reality, though, that the audiences will vote with their fingers on this issue. So if they're not happy with the new network content, if they're not happy with the voices and the playlists coming from London or elsewhere, they will simply switch over. And these stations need the advertising revenue that the audience bring. And they've already said to committee, as they did last week, that if they need to make changes, then they will reverse some of these decisions. I'm quite buoyed by that, because I think actually they need those audiences because they need the advertising revenue. Fiona Hisla. Well, that is the argument that the market is king, and therefore, in terms of deregulation, the, vote, the, you know, the, the, the audience will vote for their feet. The danger is who will they turn over to if we've lost that uh, comparison. I think that's the problem is we've, we'll, at that point we'll have lost the talent, we've lost the pipeline and I think that's the issue. That's why I think there's an opportunity uh, genuinely for Ofcom to pause to consider what the different options are. Uh, uh, regulation of, of broadcasting is of course reserved to Westminster. However, if we had greater responsibilities for broadcasting, we could ensure that proportionate decisions could be taken which recognise the local requirements and wishes of viewers and listeners in Scotland, ensuring we're equipped across both public service and commercial broadcasting to deliver the best possible output for the people of Scotland. And I think this has been a constructive and engaging debate, which has bright, rightly brought the concerns and challenges in the sector to the fore. It has also highlighted the really valuable role that radio continues to have in our communities, our constituencies and in our lives. Listening to the contributions, I think it is clear that there is broad agreement of the importance of localness in our local commercial radio and the need to protect public interest. But I think everybody's been quite realistic about the challenges that are faced. And I do think, therefore, uh, there is certainly a wider and continuing to debate to be had on this. And, presiding officer, in closing, I undertake to also send the official report um, of this debate to Ofcom, Ofcom for their consideration as well. That concludes the debate, and this meeting is closed.